Thank you everybody for being here. So it is my pleasure to introduce our uh, featured speakers for the session today. So uh, John Resch is a professional Foley artist currently working at Skywalker Sound. He has been a Foley artist for over 40 years. He was an actor at Randor High School and attended the United States International University School for Performing Arts in San Diego for one year. During that time, he, along with three other peers, created a short film called Indian Magic is What You See. This won the San Diego Film Festival in 1972. Uh, and this springboarded from there. He attended New York University and graduated with a BFA in film. He then applied and was accepted to the American Film Institute as a directing fellow. As fate would have it, a fellow filmmaker asked if he could help with the sound on the film she was working on. And that was his first taste of Foley and he never looked back from there. He is a member of Local 700, Motion Picture Studio Editors and the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. He still loves his job to this day and he credits much of his success to those he has met along the way. Uh, our other speaker is Ellie Maitland. Uh, Ellie has designed, choreographed, and performed fully for over 80 productions in Chicagoland with companies including Locked Into Vacancy Entertainment, Theater of Western Springs, Lifeline Theater, Oak Park Festival Theater, Other World Theater, the Second City Training Center, and Wild Claw Theater, where she serves as a lead designer for Death Scribe, the annual International Live Horror Radio Festival. She has guest lectured on a stage fully at Northwestern University Schools of Sound and at Harvard University's School of Music, and has consulted for theaters ranging from London, UK to Livonia, Michigan. She is also a featured voice actor on Heartlife, NFPs, Our Fair City, and Unwell. So uh, I will go ahead and start off our presentation and we will get started. Yay. Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> the year is 1927 and Warner Brothers Studios released The Jazz Singer in New York to great acclaim. It is a huge hit and audiences now want sound. It was the first feature film that had recorded dialogue. So sound would replace silent films. And it was at this moment that Jack Foley and sound intersected. Jack had the idea to create sounds that are performed to the picture. Any sound effect at that time was either captured when the camera was rolling or augmented later. <clears throat> Jack created a system to record custom sound effects or Foley as we know it today. Now Jack worked at Universal and they decided to add sound to Showboat. Universal rented a brand new and exciting Fox case sound unit called the Vitaphone to record music, voices, and sound effects for the film, Showboat. And Jack, along with a few others, took classes at the University of the Southern California in order to be introduced to this new technology. And we can push it ahead of the picture. Um, so, uh, thank you. A composite music and effects track was added to the hitherto silent Showboat. The music and effects were added simultaneously, and then the very first Foley session was born. However, it wasn't quite what we have today. We only do Foley effects at a Foley stage today, although there are some very unusual circumstances that have us work outside the Foley stage, but these are very few. Now, quickly, a fun fact. Jack Foley had told Walter Brennan to put a rock in his shoe for a characterization. He did that, and the limp that resulted became Brennan's famous trademark. In fact, if you've ever seen The Real McCoys, then you will, if you've ever seen the, the real McCoys, that is Walter as Grandpa Amos and the famous Jelly Limp. And now as to how important Foley can be, we need to look no further than this great picture itself on the screen, Spartacus. Spartacus was a 1960 movie that showed scenes of slaves walking in leg chains and Roman soldiers in their outfits marching with them. The director, Stanley Kubrick, was all set to return to Italy to restage the entire scene to capture the sound effects on location. As the first time the scene was shot, there were problems with the production sound. <laughs> Jack stepped in and did the whole sequence with footsteps and keychains. And there are the keys right there, folks. 
<clears throat> um, no need to reshoot. The, those are the actual keys. The use of Foley as a description for what we really are doing, custom sound effects, came into being towards the end of Jack's life. The stage he used at Universal was called Sync Gay Stage, but as time went along, if people needed sync effects, they would go and say, mm, let's go to Jack's Foley stage, or how about going to Foley stage, or let's go see Jack, or finally just turned into, let's go to the Foley stage. And that moniker stuck. And that's it for me so far. Ellie. Now, Foley's name is the one that stuck, but there are many artists working across Hollywood as what was then known as walkers or steppers due to that most famous of Foley cues, footsteps. All of those artists contributed to this form in its early days, like Jimmy McDonald. McDonald originally worked as a percussionist and engineer before a broken leg forced him into a career change. His ingenuity and gift of rhythm uh, landed him at Walt Disney Studios, where he created the sounds of classics like Alice in Wonderland, Snow White, and eventually even took over the voice of Mickey Mouse from Walt Disney himself. Perhaps in another timeline, when it was our time to tailor the sounds to our films, rather than head to the Foley studio, we would go to McDonald's. I also want to tell you about Orrin Nichols. Nichols designed the sound effects for Orson Welles' infamous production of War of the Worlds. The sound of the top of the Martian craft unscrewing was actually a jelly jar lid that Aura unscrewed inside a dry toilet basin. But again, the word orator already had another use. Aura Nichols began her performance career on the vaudeville circuit as a traveling trap drummer. Trap, short for contraption, drummers had elaborate percussion rigs set up next to the screens in silent uh, movie houses. Trap drummers accompanied the action in the films of physical comedians like Buster Keaton or Charlie Chaplin with the sound of cymbal crashes, tweeting birds, shattering glass, dog barks, boat whistles, or even trains barreling down the tracks. Pictured here is only a part of an internationally recognized collection of these vintage trap effects curated by John and my friend Nicholas White. You can see train and boat whistles up top varying in pitches, and those round things on the bottom left were used as horse hoofs. Once silent films began losing ground to the talkies, folks like Aura transitioned either into film work or radio, where a lot of her skill set was already applicable. A lot of the techniques we use in Foley were already in use by vaudeville, slapstick, Media. The list goes on through history. Audiences wanted sound in their storytelling well before we had the luxury of pre-recorded sound. In Shakespeare's time, a raging thunderstorm could be created using a thunder run, a series of gutters above the audience and stage where stagehands would roll wooden cannonballs. Quick story. John Dennis was a playwright active in the early 18th century. His play, Apheus in Virginia, you know that one? It's okay, no one does. It wasn't successful. <laughs> what was successful, though, was a new technique he employed for the sound of thunder, an easily portable, long, thin metal sheet they rattled off stage, what we now know as a thunder sheet. Now, a few months after Apius and Virginia closed, the same theater was mounting a production of Macbeth and using his thunder sheet for the storm. This is where we get the expression, you're stealing my thunder. So while Foley was coined for bespoke sound effects in film, the term is often now used to refer to sounds similarly produced for animation, TV, radio plays, and good old live theater. Take it away, John. Well, upcoming on the screen now, we're going to see something in the more modern era. As far as, uh, well, we're going to play a clip from the LA Times that put out many years ago that uh, yours truly was in, and a much younger version. <clears throat> uh, and... Uh, well, I think really we'll let it speak for itself. You know, we'll look at that, then, then we'll have a chance to chat about it for a second. So we're going to run that now. Foley is live sound effects recorded on a sound stage in sync with the picture to replace any sound that needs to be replaced. The First time that I ever found out that this job existed, I just said, this is for me. You get to play in the dirt all day and come up with funny props. The hardest part of the job for me really is the physicality. That was perfect, let's move on. A big pad for the body sound, a bunch of celery for some high-end crunch, and a nice wet chamois will give me a fleshy sound. I'm gonna take some breakfast cereal, put it in here with the cornstarch. These are gloves with paper clips taped onto the ends for the dog claws and you get a good paw sound out of the glove. The creative part of this job is using anything and everything that'll work, whether it's real or not. Foley philosophy is do it till it's right, period.
So as you can tell, this is a job that really nobody wants to do. It's no fun. And uh, for the record, by the way, I still feel those body falls on my right side. But <laughs> that being said, uh, that gives you a little look behind the scenes. And uh, now I'm going to go back over to Ellie. Very cool. Thank you, John. Another amazing facet of Foley art is how many people only associate certain experiences through seeing and hearing them in media fiction. So that conditions how we think things should sound when we encounter them in real life. A great topic of discussion with your students is the idea of sound to help them recognize those differences. Now let's talk about how these sounds are made, starting with types of Foley props. Our first major category are instruments that were built for the job. That's going to include Foley doors, like this one, warbling bird whistles, noise putty for the sound of farting, and musical instruments. Uh, working with musicians is a major asset, both for the skills they possess and the instruments they hopefully own. There's also more music and musicality integrated in sonic storytelling than we realize, thanks to nearly a century of cartoons. The mechanism pictured here is a marching machine, a bundle of wooden pegs that you roll to produce the sound of an army marching in lockstep. Next up, we have sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. Sometimes the original object is going to be your best option, like fabric for the sound of clothing, or shoes for footsteps, or iconic sounds like the pop of a soda can or the flick of a light switch. Then we have found and repurposed objects. Now, this is my favorite category because it encourages the most experimentation. And we have a list of common examples here as well as in your handouts, but John has some awesome examples uh, we're going to show you right now. Well, <clears throat> indeed, I have here a tuning fork. Tuning fork. What could that be used for? Well, I will tell you. I'm glad you asked. E.T., the extraterrestrial. When E.T. is healing Elliot's finger, that was the sound used as Elliot, uh, E.T.'s finger went to help take care of Elliot. And, uh, of course, I found that on a garage sale down in Venice, California. Um, also, too, if you've seen the film Hook, um, there was Tinkerbell basically, how do we make her fly? Let's 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 give her some feeling to the wings, but not just little wing beats. So now these are called harmony balls. Back in the day when we had head shops, you would buy this, it would be on a lanyard, go around your neck, and I guess it would give you good vibes as you're walking around. We took these, cut off the lanyard, and there they are. In fact, we had about 20 of these, and each one was uh, an emotion if you will, to try to help move the storyline forward. Again, those are just a couple. Now, back over to, to Ellie. Awesome. Thank you, John. And that's going to take us into challenges in Foley for stage versus studio. While many of the techniques employed in Foley on stage and in the studio are the same, the differences in approach are almost always caused by the differences in resources. This can mean certain limitations, but it also affords opportunities for greater theatricality from the performers and more profound complicity with the audience. We'll get back to that idea in a little bit. Remember, in theater, we're part of the finished product both orally and visually. I should note, though, that uh, visuals are less likely to get to be part of the fun while we're all remote because Zoom video uses and loses a lot of bandwidth. So it's probably best to think of these differences more in the context of live versus pre-recorded instead of stage versus studio. Now, I could talk for another hour about performance theater theory. John's seen me do it. Uh, but because our time today is short, we're just going to focus on facilitating design and production with your students. Those different resources I mentioned are time, space, budget, and personnel. Starting with time. In contemporary sound design for screen and radio, you have the luxury of multiple takes, while in stagecraft, precision gives you the clearest ways to communicate with your audience. This, of course, means the more complex your soundscape is, like the duration of the sound, the number of props, the number of Foley artists, their own level of expertise, the more rehearsal you'll need with all those elements. A barbershop quartet rehearses differently from a soloist. Now, this might seem like a weird picture to pair with the idea of time, but it's super common in Foley to use fruit and veggies for the sounds of violence. Uh, celery is really famous for providing the sounds of broken bones and melons often provide the gore and gush of someone being stabbed, or in this instance, being hit, hit in the head with a brick. However, you're going to want to avoid using fruit in a show without any transition time built in because fruit has sugar and fruit juice gets sticky all over you and probably all over whatever prop you plan on handling next. Uh, when I have uh, performed shows that are a bunch of short plays strung together, like uh, Death Scribe, we always ensure that the most violent uh, plays are the ones that go right before intermission or right before curtain, simply for the cleanup time they require. 
Our next challenge is space. Space. In a sound studio, you can set props up for recording in front of the mics and then strike them at your leisure, or even bring your microphones to the props as needed. A stage setup is more likely to have a small area dedicated to microphones that will remain stationary for the whole production. Consequently, your props will need to be quickly and quietly portable. Rehearsal is also your time to develop those spatial relationships with props, organizing them based not only on when you need them, but whether you get to milk how they're revealed to the audience. Now it's time for some show and tell. <laughs> hey, John, what we got here? <laughs> well, goodness, uh, <clears throat> these are pits. This is what you'd find in a typical Foley stage. And think of a Foley stage as a theater. All the seats are out, and these are the surfaces you find on the ground. So in the left picture there, you see a little bit of grass and uh, with some leaves and dirt. In the right picture, you see that's more gravelly. And there'll be a whole bunch of these. And again, what they are is they will be a, something representational of uh, out there in the reality of life, if whatever that is. And uh, so if we do our thing, you don't know we've done it because that's actually the key to Foley. Um, and uh, not only do we have pits, but we also, let's see, um, we have another picture coming up here which would be theirs, uh, Back to the Future car door. Now, wait a second, Back to the Future car door, that doesn't look like a DeLorean. Well, it's, it is sonically. <laughs> so uh, that was created for the film and uh, it's easy to roll around as you see. So um, bottom line was that was used anytime we would touch, grab, handle anything with the DeLorean. And it points out the fact that, you know, what you use is not necessarily what you would think you would use. In other words, it's what sounds correct is what's great versus using the actual prop. And, uh, well, then I guess, I don't know, Ellie, you want to join in and say anything else? Oh, pits dug into your floor, whole car doors. There has to be an easier way. <laughs> so if I'm doing a stage show where I don't have all of that space, instead of using a pit with gravel and grass in it for walking through grass and leaves, I might go. common grocery sack that's been filled with VHS tape, if any of you are old enough to know what that is. And for the sound of walking through grit and gravel, I could go, this is a sensory toy. It's a rubber ball filled with plastic ball uh, beads that I just found at a, a kid's toy shop. And if you can't even afford to uh, have a car door in your space, then I often will go. using a plastic briefcase for the sound of a car door opening and slamming. Here's another quick comparison I want to show you. We move forward. Great, thank you. That is uh, the setup I had for a production of The Shadow with Lifeline Theater here in Chicago back in 2016, a simpler time. You can see uh, we've got a lot of space stretched out for the table full of props that we're going to be picking up. And we've got one of those Foley doors. That's a really big one by Foley door perspective, uh, like standards. It came up up to my rib cage. Now you juxtapose this wonderful layout with, this is the setup I had for a production of Julius Caesar over Zoom from my studio apartment a couple of months ago. Uh, the most notorious sound sequence probably in Julius Caesar is going to be his murder in the Senate. So all the actors that were playing the senators uh, provided the sound of their own daggers unsheathing using kitchen cutlery from their own homes, while I provided the sound of the increasingly gory and visceral stabbing using a head of lettuce with a fork, uh, several stalks of celery, and a soaked chamois cloth. So what we're looking at right here is literally a Caesar salad. <laughs> Moving on to budget. Here's another way to look at the props you'll need. Uh, props that provide a single specialized sound will be items like shoes for footsteps. Speaking of shoes, John. Well, uh, by the way, et tu, Ellie. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's Ross Taylor, part of the very famous Ross Taylor and Kitty Malone the first independent Foley artists, they would be gypsies. They would go from stage to stage versus the studio system, which would have people at their particular studio and only work at the studio. So they really were the genesis of the Foley artists that we know today. And that's Ross, just with some of his shoes. He probably had about 45 pairs of shoes. And I have 150 with a 12 pair of high heels. But, well, let's stop right there. Uh, Ellie, back to you. So yeah, like in a film, you'd be very likely to differentiate many different types of footwear or probably several different pairs for a single character, but you'll want to scale down for the sake of a live show, both for the real estate and for the cost. Conversely, 
You'll also have props that can act as multiple sounds, depending on how they're used. Remember I mentioned musical instruments earlier? Not only do things like that help save space and cost, but they also encourage the audience to celebrate the versatility of the performers. I'm going to talk real quick about context as casting. That concept is at the heart of a lot of what we're discussing today. So in a film, a really common way to create the sound of sustained rainfall is uh, to record the sound of frying bacon. But what about a scene where there's rain outside and someone is making breakfast? In film, the camera shots would dictate what you're seeing and therefore inform what you were hearing. In audio drama, the dialogue does the same thing. And remember also the idea of complicity. The audience wants the story to make sense. So if you say a thing and then make a noise, they're very likely to go along for the ride because the artists and the audience are working together to build a world and its vocabulary. We're all in this together and I think that's really cool. Back to props. Props that are single use or expendables like breakables or produce can eat a big hole in your budget and should be added as close to tech as possible. And you can mime or sub with non-perishable stand-ins until then. Finally, our last resource is personnel. Often, as in a studio, a radio theater employs only a single Foley artist or perhaps a pair. Um, th that means, unfortunately, we rarely have the studio's option to go back and layer additional sounds on top of each other. Uh, the more eager hands you have at the mics, the more complex the story can become. So we've got one more video we want to show you real quick. Um, I mentioned that production of Julius Caesar I did earlier this year during quarantine times. Um, normally, it would be me and at least one other person creating the sound of a thunderstorm, but since it was just me for this production of Julius Caesar, here's what that ended up looking like. Yay. <laughs> okay, so now what? We have all this history, we have all this theory. Um, what do we do to bring our students into it? Now we're gonna share with you one of my favorite uh, exercises to do with a class. This is a script deconstruction exercise. Uh, you'll start with a script with dialogue, but no sound effects included. Then you'll guide your students using context clues to determine the sounds of the environment and the character's actions. You'll incorporate those sounds into the script with experimentation to sound design your story. I'll show you how I use a spreadsheet to track this part. Then you'll assign students to perform each sound effect, resulting in a rehearsable, fully choreographed audio drama, including a pre-show checklist, another spreadsheet, that'll guide you all into performance. So let's walk through this now. Uh, we've got a short script with no sound effects to start with, and we also have our excellent volunteers, Eric and Christina, who have graciously agreed to do some voice acting for us today. Are you two feeling ready? Uh, I sure am. <laughs> You're ready. Christina, are you ready? I am ready. Awesome. Thank you so much, you two. Uh, so presenting Missed Connections in Space. All right. Travelogue of Spaceship Wild Goose. This is Captain Garcia reporting. Stardate 867-5309. Our diplomatic mission to the surface of Rigel 4 must be declared unsuccessful. It was a total bust. Carvalho, please don't interrupt my report. <clears throat> After waiting for four Earth hours, there were no signs of the regalians, and our communications went unanswered. Still, the trip was not entirely disappointing. The view lived up to the stories, a glittering landscape unlike any other in our galaxy. Yeah, your galaxy. It was all right. Ah, <sighs> Carvalho. We left the rendezvous point and promptly returned to the spaceship for decontamination and departure. 
It was pretty down there. I took some gemstones as a souvenir. Carvlo, you brought potentially contaminated matter on board our ship without clearance? They're shiny. We better get Dr. Hurwitz to look at these. Dr. Hurwitz, to the bridge. I got here as fast as I could. What do you need, Captain? Please, examine the gemstones Carvalho is holding for potential hazards. Okay, scanning. They seem to be harmless, but they're not gemstones. They're eggs. Eggs? Whoa, are you a Nigerian? Greetings. I apologize for my tardiness to our peace summit. We must have a development. It seems some of our eggs have gone missing. Awesome. Great work, everybody. Thank you. So from here, we'd ask our students what the dialogue tells us about where the characters are, what we're doing, and how we illustrate that in sound. This is a template I use to keep track while we're designing. So we start with the sound effects, uh, what we think the sound effects are going to be, uh, page numbers for reference. Uh, if it's a really complex sequence, you can add not only page numbers, but also line numbers like we had in the script just now. The next section is where we brainstorm what props we'll be using to accomplish those sounds. Habit is, do we already own or have access to this prop, or is it something that we're going to need to rent, borrow, or is it an expendable item that we're going to have to replenish every time? Foley notes, this is where I would jot down questions or ideas I have for the director or the playwright or for the voice actor. And it could be something as basic as, does the voice actor feel like their character would shut this door gently or slam it angrily? Or if I'm working with a uh, playwright on an original work, I might have ideas for how to further incorporate more sounds to earn the medium of audio genre, uh, drama. The director notes section, I guess they're allowed to have some opinions too. <laughs> the props list is where I would itemize the props I end up deciding on from that brainstorming section. Pre-show would be anything that you need to do to those props to make them show ready. Like if it's fruit and veggies and they're going in someone's mouth, make sure that you're rinsing them. Or if it's an electronic prop, you need to make sure you're switching out the batteries before each show. Uh, or if you've got something that needs to be tuned, like a musical instrument. The last section is a uh, color code. I recommend highlighting any expendables in green so they pop out at you so you can make sure that you're replenishing them before each rehearsal or performance. Uh, also, if you're borrowing anything from a, a certain group or person, you need to make sure that you're coordinating all of those respectively so you'll make sure to get all of them back to that person at the end of your production. Remember the prime directive, put things back where you found them. So this is uh, the sheet that John and I came up with for this script. And I want to emphasize, this is just how we decided to design and perform this piece. So it's one answer, but it's not the right answer. One of the things I love about this exercise is that you could have five different classes start with the same script and have the story go in very different directions based on what the students' choices are of what sounds go where. So we incorporated those sound effects into a new draft of the script that looks like this, with the sound effects written in. This gives us the information we need to assign sound effects to our Foley artists and rehearse. One of the last documents I create is our pre-show checklist. And here's a template for that. Yay. So that, uh, that helps us track which prop starts with which Foley artist, any pre-show needs, and any sequences we want to make sure we run with our voice actors right before we perform for the audience, uh, almost like a fight call in theater. And so here's what John and my version looks like for this script. We've got all of the props, we've got whom they're starting with or staying with since we're both remote and anything that we need to make sure that we we're doing pre-show. Another thing I always like to make sure to emphasize with folks is if you're working off hard copies, always uh, date your drafts. That is crucial to make sure that you're all literally and figuratively on the same page. So now we have a final version of our script where the individual elements of each sound effect have been itemized and assigned. Actors and Foley, are we ready to perform the final product? We are. Excellent. John, I'm going to ask you to read us in this time because I've got the first sound effect and it requires my mouth. All right. Miss Connections in Space. Travelogue of the Spaceship Wild Goose. This is Captain Garcia reporting. Start date 867-5309. Our diplomatic mission to the surface of Rigel 4 must be declared unsuccessful. It was a total bust. Carvalho, 
Please, don't interrupt my report. <clears throat> After waiting for four Earth hours, there was no sign of the Regalians, and our communications went unanswered. Still, the trip was not entirely disappointing. The view lived up to the stories, a glittering landscape unlike any other in our entire yeah. galaxy. Yeah, your galaxy. It was all right. <sighs> Carvlo, we left the rendezvous point and promptly returned to the ship for decontamination and departure. It was pretty down there. I took some gym, some of the gemstones as souvenirs. Carvalho, you brought potentially contaminated matter on board our ship without clearance? They're shiny. We better get Dr. Hurwitz to look at these. <laughs> Dr. Hurwitz, to the bridge. I got here as fast as I could. What do you need, Captain? Please examine the gemstones Carvlo is holding for potential hazards. Okay, scanning. They seem to be harmless, but they're not gemstones. They're eggs. Eggs? Are you a Regalian? Greetings. I apologize for my turning this to our peace summit. We have had a development where it seems some of our eggs have been displaced. Yay! <laughs> Great job, everyone. Thank you so much. And <laughs> this next version I am showing you is just in case, uh, I've said before that I do a lot of work with original texts for uh, existing play, uh, uh, like living playwrights, but there's also a so almost a century of radio drama that is already like uh, locked and also not digitized. So this is what it might look like if I was writing our uh, sound choreography notation into a version that we couldn't edit in Google Drafts. Now, we have some additional exercises in your handouts that you can incorporate into a unit on audio drama for your students as well. I do want to make sure, though, that we get to hear. John, will you tell us what sound, what props you used for creating your sound effects in that production? Well, let's see. I used a, a, what do you call the Roden click switcher, which is actually just an old cassette deck. And then uh, a prop from Back to the Future that uh, was in the old days when you get your, your messages from your machine that were, you know, telephonically, somebody would call and leave a message. This, this is how you use that over the phone to get your messages. And uh, then my voice, and that's pretty much it. Yeah, oh, sorry, the most important thing. That's what I meant to bring up. Wet footsteps were, yes, a sponge, and of course to keep the wet from going all over my computer, a little bowl. Very cool, thank you so much. And yeah, I had to put it on a little bit of a mat for myself because the hatching of the egg that I was uh, uh, creating was a, a sugar waffle ice cream cone. And working back from there, the gemstones that I had uh, were just dice in a little bag, so I wouldn't run the risk of dropping anything while I was handling them. And the sounds of the spaceship door were my mouth, and also the sound of a manually cranked egg beater. And the sound of the spaceship was a siren whistle and a thunder tube, which has lots of different fun practical applications in audio drama work. Moving on from there, uh, we do have a couple of additional projects that you can be doing. Uh, that one was the most intensive of all of these. And I see a question from Tina, I think, if we could uh, have copies of the spreadsheets. This should all be in the handouts that you're taking home today. Um, but moving on, I want to make sure that we get to the resources uh, that you can uh, also look at after this presentation is over. Eric, can we jump to slide 41? Thank you. John, you want to tell us about this? Goodness, so what you see screen left, that's my daughter. She's got a podcast, therightscuff.com. Uh, I'm interviewing other people. Not that I'm, my ego's that big, truly it's not. It's much more about the other people. And there is a Foley Artist Facebook group on the uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Facebook page. It's a private group, so you would navigate there and just answer the questions and agree to the rules, and you'll come in. And there's interesting resources. In fact, every Sunday we typically have an interview with one or more people that are within the context of the business could be Foley centric or sound or 
whomever. But um, most important thing is I hope that you have had fun today. Back to you, Ellie. Thank you, John. Next up, we've got some books that you can check out. One of my favorites I've ever read is Radio Sound Effects by Robert Mott. He was a radio man active in the industry from the 30s through the 60s. And it's amazing to hear all the things that were happening for the first time and are still happening today. Uh, we've also got uh, a contemporary take on sound design. Uh, thanks to podcasting, we're in a renaissance for radio plays and audio drama right now. And so this was written by Casey Whalen, who's of the uh, We're Alive zombie series. He's got a bunch of other properties out there as well. He's a great person to know and to read his work. And then we've also got The Holy Grail, which was written by Vanessa Thema Mentz. This is one of the most well-respected books on Foley and its applications and its history uh, that you'll see in a lot of uh, university classes as well. And I think she's working on a third edition of that one right now too. And from here, we've also got, we skip forward one, my Pinterest page. This is just a page I've been curating for years of not only uh, fully actual practical sound effects that are used in films, but also just great ideas for ways to incorporate sound into our storytelling. And you might see a little familiar face over there on the bottom right from before even John and I knew each other. <laughs> and from here, I think uh, now it's just time for questions. Well, everybody's fallen asleep. <laughs> <laughs> Goodness, don't be shy. <clears throat> now is now is the time to, of course, from a foley artist standpoint, there are more astronauts in the world than, are work, than there are working professional foley artists. So now is your moment. Don't be shy. Oh, well, I see. So they've all, all been told to be muted. Oh, well. Uh... So, John, from the chat, we do have a question. Have okay. Foley artists lost any work to digital sound libraries? The short answer, answer is yes. The longer answer is it depends upon the uh, money uh, budget that's for the picture or project and the director or the talent that's involved and what level of creativity they want. So in other words, David Fincher is not, repeat not, going to be using something from a, a library, let us, like footsteps from a library. Whereas... Maybe somebody's just doing his first picture or her first picture. They have no money, so maybe they would need to rely on somebody helping them to cut some footsteps in, etc. You know, um, <clears throat> I, of course, that doesn't have soul. Soul is what actual Foley performance brings to a project. Not not putting down a film that doesn't have the budget for that, because I think it's great. You know, I love film, but that's really the short answer. Thank you. I would also piggyback on that and say that because we're in such a digitized level of uh, hist a period of history right now, a lot of creativity has become democratized in a way where it's going to be up to what you uh, prioritize on any given project. And one of the reasons why we want to make sure that we're talking to uh, educators and students moving forward is so that they know that creating original sound effects and uh, extension of that creating additional concepts for canonized sounds is always an option because we're just a part of this conversation and we're at a particular point in time that moving forward from here, a lot of the uh, sounds that we consider to be canonized and therefore cliche might not be applicable in storytelling uh, 10 years from now because uh, life is going to look so different, but because people have become uh, disenchanted by the vocabulary that we already have established. The more familiar you are with the what of any storytelling, the more innovative the how gets to be. That's one of the things that I love about the Chicago theater scene is it's a very experimental scene. And we have a lot of folks that identify as theater artists rather than traditionally just as actors or actresses. And it's because we're all very artistically invested in how we're telling these stories, also in why we're telling these stories. So that's going to be a very big factor in any sort of uh, artistic create, uh, creative innovations moving forward. Great, thank you. And do you have any recommendations for an activity for younger kids, elementary school age or younger? Ellie, I'll let you take that initially. Uh, yeah, I think that guided listening activities are a really good idea. Um, if you uh, either uh, create the sounds for them or just have them sit still for a little while and itemize what sounds naturally occur in their environment. 
uh, they're going to be learning a lot about what the sounds are and what those sounds mean to them. And uh, you can go from there for building a vocabulary. Uh, there's also fun things that you can be doing with storybooks for call and response with younger kids too, uh, giving them a set a uh, bunch of instruments or props that they can be playing with and that they start to identify with particular uh, moments in the story, uh, being, uh, being characters or their actions. Okay. Yep. I would imagine sound is a little different depending on format, film, theater, and Zoom. Working in a Zoom world, do you have any specific advice to make sure the sound quality from different sources is fairly consistent? Ellie? <laughs> I wish I had better news about that one, to be honest with you. Uh, <laughs> one of the things that we're really learning consistently the hard way is that Zoom is ultimately conferencing software. It is not theater or sound design software, which means there's a lot of compression going on. And so part of it is just uh, wishful thinking that y'all are going to be hearing the same things on your end that we're creating on our end. Uh, you can make things a little bit more unified by having uh, a lot of the same microphones. That's a big cost issue though, and probably not necessarily something that all of your students are gonna have access to. Um, but there are also like lots of free downloadable softwares that they can be using for sound work. And one of the things that you could be doing uh, so long as we're remote is not relying exclusively on Zoom's sound capturing software for what they're creating. If you use something that's a uh, free market like Audacity to have a session running in the background while they're creating their sounds, then you'll have a more true to their experience sound uh, file that you can be building off of if you're going to be mixing all of this after the fact. Yeah, Zoom, Zoom's vanilla. That's just the, the reality, you know, nothing against it. And certainly it's helped bring people together during this time. But, uh, you know, once we get past this, then, um, you know, it'll be time to, as I say, get back with a question with the you know, elementary school kids. And we actually on the Foley Artist page, we have a, what we call a Foley Artist uh, Children's Foley Workshop. So uh, what we just did today, Ellie and I, we have kids from around the world, okay, one uh, girl from New Zealand, et cetera, and they, we, they have a script. And they have their props that they either build or utilize to perform to um, to be, you know, again, within the community of, of humanity right now, <laughs> since we're in our lifeboats. But uh, and to that end, not to not to proselytize, but I just want to say I, I wish each and every one of you uh, to be safe and be well. And um, because especially these days, it's it's difficult for people. You know, some are having problems. And so if you know of anybody or you can reach out to somebody to make a little difference, I think that's a wonderful thing. And we'll get out. We're going to come out the other side of this, I think, stronger. So anyway, back to you, Ellie, <laughs> or questions. Okay, that's great. And I love the possibilities for student careers. How would a student pursue this career? Are we talking f working fully in film or a performance fully for Ellie? Uh, well, let me, let me just say for film real quick. Um, Probably uh, right now, the best place to be would be in Los Angeles. And you would have to have a war chest of money up for at least six months, if not more, to where uh, you could basically pound the pavement and go visit various facilities, especially non-union small places, and just maybe, you know, get the coffee, be a gopher. So you just get, get your, literally get your foot in the door. And then if, you know, it happens, great. Um, certainly in the meantime, there are many things one can do to practice um, hand-eye coordination, believe it or not, video games are a good thing, no more than an hour. Uh, sports, certainly you want to get your, you want to do swimming, yoga, tennis, excellent hand-eye coordination, and practicing at home, you know, record friends on a DVR, put down a piece of wood, and just walk on it, so when a character walks in a particular shoe, you walk in too, practice that. You know, all these things can be done. Um, but my path really quick was not to become a Foley artist. I thought I was going to be a director. So I think it's very important to be open and listen to your gut. You know, so if somebody has a dream, I think I want to be a Foley artist, certainly, especially when they're young, try it. But be open, especially if people tell you something you're good at, it's unsolicited. You know, if they say, God, Terry, you are the best photographer I've ever seen. Of course, Terry wants to be a CPA. Well, you know, maybe listen to that. But anyway, what would you say on that, Ellie? Oh, there you myself. And I would say it's never too late to try something new. Um, I also uh, wound up in Foley indirectly, but ultimately logically. 
Um, I went to school for acting and I have uh, experience as a dancer and also uh, with music studies. And those are all uh, different things that uh, translate really effectively to the cross disciplines in Foley. And one of the reasons why I love Chicago and its tendency to create theater artists is because it uh, encourages folks to realize that there are many more vibrant and compelling ways to be performers than to just be the one talking. Um, and it's all about uh, how much energy you put into it and not maybe not necessarily focusing on it as a career right now, because as we know, the arts are struggling. Um, we don't, we have a lot of reasons to be hopeful right now, but we still have a lot of heavy lifting uh, ahead of us as a culture, as a country, as a, a bunch of micro communities. And so finding things that you're passionate about and using and finding reasons for those to sustain you that may not necessarily have monetary returns right now is going to be really valuable for everyone. And that's one of the reasons why the arts are important to us anyway. Um, but I started my path as a Foley artist maybe nine years ago. And I am so lucky for the opportunities that I've had in Chicago scene because people knew that I was that lady that thought that was cool. And so they knew I would take it seriously. And that meant that I was building more and more experience and expertise and getting some really good stories out of it too. Uh, and having opportunities for more challenging and more ambitious experiences because they always build on top of the experiences you've had before. I don't know if that answers anything. <laughs> All right, awesome. Well, thank you so much, John and Ellie. I think we are at our 50 minute time cap. So we're gonna cut our presentation there and we'll let everybody move on to their next breakout session. So uh, again, thank you so very much everybody for attending and uh, stay creative. All stay right. Creative. Be well, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thanks so much for coming. Yep.